Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. In many ways, love is about communication. But what about when you're trying to communicate with someone in a different language that you're not fully fluent in? Emily Robbins writes about that in her essay, Grappling with the Language of Love. It's read by Saoirse Ronan. She recently starred as Joe March in Little Women. We often hear about how hard it is to be articulate in a foreign language. But when I began to study Arabic, what took me a long time to learn was not how to speak, but how to listen. Looking back, I see that my inability to listen well cost me my first love. The man I loved was an Iraqi doctor, young like me. He had been forced out of his country by war and had come to Syria to work in a refugee camp. This was in 2008, before the revolution. I was in Syria to study Arabic. We met in that camp and for the next year we were constantly falling in and out of love, breaking up and getting back together pouring out our hearts and fighting, mostly because of all he wanted to tell me that I didn't understand. We did this in Arabic, his first and my second language. The doctor and I were both alone in Damascus. He claimed he loved me from the moment we first spoke because I had asked him a question. This meant I was curious and ready to learn. I don't remember my question. What I remember is the dust, which was overwhelming. And the sun, which would not stop beating. And all the patched white tents which spread out from the doctor's ambulance, like the petals of a flower. I went into the ambulance to get out of the sun. The doctor was rocking a crying baby and when he touched it, the baby quieted and fell asleep. I thought, I want this man to like me as much as I like him. But I didn't have strong Arabic, so I simply gazed at the doctor and he gazed back. After, he called me. We met in a cafe. He sent me a poem. I didn't understand the poem, which didn't matter. We were headed for love. I was a beginner in Arabic. I loved it and was trying to learn. I knew the word for hospital, but not emergency. Love, but not passion. War, but not civil war. The doctor and I wanted to be writers, so in our free time we studied how to be eloquent. Sometimes I asked, how can you love me when I speak in articulate Arabic? He assured me that he heard past my poorly constructed sentences to the beauty within. We didn't worry about whether I found him articulate because Arabic was his first language. We had not yet learned the lesson that vocabulary limits not just how well you speak, but how well you listen. We expected me to be inarticulate and him to be eloquent. We loved specificity and detail and the doctor used great detail in his stories. But my Arabic vocabulary was blunt and broad, so I heard him as being blunt and broad. We went to a lecture. In the middle, the doctor wrote on my paper, You look beautiful in your glasses. I didn't know the word for glasses, so I read, You beautiful. He wrote, 
I imagine you in a bath of rose petals. I didn't know the word for rose petals, so I read, you bath. Did I stink? We learn the words we most need. I had grown up in a small, sheltered town, so my vocabulary for war was limited. But war had coloured the doctor's work, his home, his first love, not me, and his sense of purpose. I remember the bombs that fell on the emergency room, he said, and I understood there had been a bomb, but not how close it was to the hospital or how he had worked through the terror, his hands shaking. Our troubles worsened when the doctor called and told me something while I was at work, but I didn't understand and was in the middle of something, so I said I was busy. Could he call back? Later, when we reconnected, he said, You have no heart. I told you the camp caught fire. People were hurt. Two lost their homes and you said, Call back later, I'm busy. My heart sank. I'm sorry, I told him. I didn't hear you. Do you ever hear me? Of course, there are many ways to hear a person. It doesn't always have to be in speech. That night, though, we got stuck on words. Afterward, we still saw each other, but it was not the same. Soon, my grant ended and I went home. I thought, it must not have really been love. How could the doctor love me when I didn't understand him? And if I could not understand him or know him completely, how could I love him back? This was my belief for years. I still sometimes heard from the doctor, but we were far away, an ocean between us, and I no longer believed we had really loved. Then I met the man who would become my husband, a student with long hair who had come to the United States from Brazil to learn biology. When he rode up on a bicycle to the building where I lived, my heart almost stopped. He knew all the scientific terms in English, but didn't know simple words like believe or calm. And yet after we met, I only wanted to be with him. I wanted to pour out my heart, to talk and to listen. And if anyone ever questioned our love, because it happened so quickly, over two months, or if he had ever questioned my devotion, because we did not speak the same language fluently, it would have ripped straight through my heart. So I found myself in the doctor's position, and I learned that sometimes it can be enough just to speak the words, regardless of whether your lover understands them that sometimes merely wanting to speak is enough. The doctor had once said, you know me like I know you, and if you don't, then someday you will. He had had faith in the future. I loved the way my husband looked when he was listening. He made up games that didn't require language. He didn't write poetry in English, but he drew pictures on scraps of paper and left them about the house for me. And in this way, I knew what he felt. What had I done to show I cared for the doctor? Over the years, I continued studying Arabic and my language grew. When I began to translate for people from war-torn countries, I gained a specialised vocabulary. Armed with my new vocabulary, I went back to the doctor's poems. I took them out of their old box, one by one. To my delight, I found that the doctor was eloquent. He wrote with precision and conviction. I went back to his story about the bombing and understood now how, in the middle of surgery, his hands were shaking so hard that he had not known if he could finish. But there was a patient before him, so he steeled himself and saw it through and the patient survived. The bravery of this. 
I learned terrible things about the exact ways he had been tortured and beaten, about the strangeness of death threats he had received simply because he was good at his work. I learned that sometimes to be good is the most dangerous thing. And finally, after so many years, I learned his sense of beauty. He wrote a poem about a jasmine flower that bloomed while wedged between dust and the ice of a wintry desert. Whether he meant this flower to be us no longer mattered. What mattered was that his words lasted. As beautiful now as then, his words had kept until I could listen and understand. Years after the doctor and I had fallen out of love, I finally knew him. He is now married and lives in Sweden, where he works for the Red Cross. Soon after I left Syria, he got in trouble for his politics and was forced to flee. A refugee with an uncertain passport, he made the precarious journey up through Turkey, across the sea in an unstable boat, five years before thousands of Syrian refugees fleeing their own war would make the same trip. He still writes poems, which used to air on the local radio and were so popular that people would call in and ask for The Love Doctor. I listened to the show, using my dictionary to look up the hard words. Maybe, in the end, his poems are the gift of our romance. Along with this lesson, even years later, we can learn from a relationship there is no deadline for understanding and that just as one can love intuitively without language one can also revel years later in the perfect meaning of a once spoken misunderstood word That's Saoirse Ronan reading Emily Robbins' piece, Grappling with the Language of Love. We'll catch up with Emily after the break. We asked Emily Robbins why she decided to study Arabic in Syria back in 2008. She says it was because of her cousin, Rachel Corey. She was a peace activist in Palestine, and she was killed when she was protesting the demolition of a Palestinian home. She was the first American to die in that way, and so she became famous. And her death sort of threw my whole extended family into a conflict at the time we knew very little about. For me, I was 18, and I was just starting college, and I felt like after her death, someone in the family should speak Arabic. And I wanted to be that person. But then when I got to Syria, I found that I just loved Arabic so much. And my time in Syria just was a time of a lot of learning and growth, the way I think everyone sort of has those times in their lives. And my time, the time when I really felt like I became an adult, was in Syria. Years after she left the country, she took a job as an Arabic translator for an organization that worked with survivors of torture. Then she went back to the doctor's poems. I had really cared for the doctor, and so I knew that he was like a deep and thoughtful person. But at how much more deep and thoughtful he really was than I, sort of in my lack of Arabic, was giving him credit for. And that was a really powerful realization to come to years after what became a, a young romance, right? Like I had, we had both moved on at that point, and so much had changed. And yet it felt in a lot of ways, really hopeful to come back to that and to realize that like these poems could stand the test of time and that I could still go back to that time and learn something new in my memory. Emily never told the doctor what she'd realized about his poems or about her modern love piece. That was a romance of the past. And how many of your romances do you still, you know, of your, of your former lovers, do you still really talk to, you know? And... I'm married in a wonderful relationship, and, and he's married. And so 
I just think that even though this realization was really wonderful and important for me to have, that time in our lives has passed. And I think that's okay, and both of us are okay with that. And how did Emily's husband react to her story about another man? I was living in Jordan in the year that my piece came out. And so my husband, the brave soul that he is, went to Thanksgiving with my entire extended family all by himself. Um, <laughs> and the piece had come out right before Thanksgiving. And so my whole family was just asking him, you know, like, what do you think of this piece? <laughs> like, what do you think about the, about the fact that you're, you know, your wife had this other love? He thought it was fine. My husband doesn't get jealous very easily. Um, when it came out too, he shared it on Facebook, I think by saying something like, if you want to read about my wife's past love affairs or something like that, then read, <laughs> then read this piece. Emily and her husband have been together for eight years now. He's a biology researcher at the University of Oslo, and she's a writer. Emily's novel is A Word for Love. They live in Norway with their new baby boy. We've got more after the break. Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times, says that when he started reading Emily's essay, he thought it was going to be a sad story of missed opportunity with the doctor. But it spins around into a, sort of a new lesson that, that uh, is, is about the future and about how he was beautiful uh, years and years later. And I love that, how she could spin it around into a, sort of a lesson about beauty and appreciation instead of a story of loss and missed opportunities. And here's Saoirse Ronan. What I felt most connected to in the piece was the clarity that she gained after this relationship and that it was something that seemed like everything at the time and, and it was so important to her and it really sort of ended up shaping her life years later. Um, I love that idea that every relationship we've been in, whether it's romantic or a friendship, it really does sort of make us who we are and helps us to see the world and other people a little bit clearer. Thanks to Sersha for reading this week's piece. She recently starred in Little Women. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer. We're edited by Catherine Brewer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Additional thanks to Mia Lee, Julia Simon, and Anya Stremian at the New York Times, and to Michael Garth at WBUR. Additional music courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. See you next week. <laughs>